lovely ladies and gentlemen. As Steve said, I'm going to move on to talk about the life of the agency. Once the agency has been born, what is it that are the issues that principals usually face with the agent, and what can the principal do about them? Well, picking up on a point that, that Lauren made at the beginning, um, don't assume when you take on an agent that um, you could expect the agent to do X, Y, and Z, because an agent is not the same as a sales rep. That might sound like a very obvious thing to say, um, but many principals who are used to using sales reps and not used to using agents um, will assume that you have the same level of control over the agent as you would over a sales rep. But the agent's very different to a sales rep, and the principal's approach must therefore be adjusted. In practice, a principal's got limited control over how an agent carries out his duties. Um, and any of you who have dealt with agents in the past will know that the agents resist very strongly any control being imposed on how they carry out their duties. However, Steve mentioned earlier the commercial agents' regulations. Well, although not a very long piece of legis legislation, there are various um, requirements imposed on the agent in that legislation, um, which the principal can use um, to his advantage. So what are they? The agent is required to make proper, proper efforts to negotiate and, where appropriate, conclude the transactions that he's instructed to take care of. The agent is required to communicate to the principal all necessary information which is available to him. And finally, and often um, most usefully from the principal's point of view, is the agent has to comply with reasonable instructions. So picking up on this last point, the agent's duty to comply with reasonable instructions, what is reasonable? Well, it will depend on all the circumstances of the case, and although that sounds like a, a cop-out, it genuinely is true, because obviously every situation is, is different. Um, but to try and sort of, um, I suppose, illustrate it, I can just give some examples. Um, you would be perfectly entitled to say to an agent you want him to contact various target accounts in his area that he hadn't contacted or you'd identified as being a potential business opportunity. But you wouldn't be entitled to say to him, I want you to visit X store on that day. You can't exercise that level of control over what the agent's doing. Equally, you're required to say to the agent that you want him to devote sufficient time to the performance of his duties under your agency to keep the customers happy and to keep you happy. He needs to be available. Um, but you can't say that you want the agent to spend all his time on at performing duties in respect of the agency for you, or even that you want him to spend specific days in a week only devoted to performing the duties of your agency. You're perfectly entitled to ask an agent to obtain feedback from customers, for example, their thoughts on the collection, why volumes, um, like order volumes have gone down over the last couple of seasons, that sort of thing. And you are, um, lastly and importantly, which is a point I'll pick up um, on later when we talk about competitors, is you're entitled to ask an agent what other agencies and business interests he has. Um, and that's something that we would very much recommend you do uh, regularly. Um, whether you could um, object to those um, other business interests and agencies will depend um, on various um, issues such as whether they compete, whether it's a, for a competing product range to the product range that, that the agent is supplying for you, um, and how much time that the agent is, is devoting to this other business and whether that impinges on his duties as an agent for you. So, moving on to um, a point that Steve made was the, the key um, the thing you'll be thinking about when you've taken an agent on, the agency started, is maximising the agent's performance. Now, one way in which principals usually do this um, is by setting sales targets and uh, most fashion brands will set sales targets for their agent on a per season basis. We often get asked, well, what can be done? The agent's missed his target for this season. What can we do about it? We're not very happy about it. Um, can we terminate the agency? That's often the question we get asked if the performance has been very bad in the season or if 
the agent's performance has been declining in general over the last few seasons? The short answer is there's never been a case um, on whether a principal can terminate an agent, an agent for poor performance. Um, but the general rule is a principal won't be able to terminate an agent, uh, agent's agency agreement um, if the agent misses his target by a small amount, say sort of 10, 15, 20%. Um, what then is the position where the agent misses his target by more than this, by a significant amount? Well, you need to consider various matters. How bad is the agent's performance? How does it compare with the performance of other agents? And it's necessary when you're doing this comparison to compare like with like. So choose, compare the agent's performance with the performance of agents in adjoining territories so you get the closest and fairest possible comparison. And thirdly, is there a specific reason for the poor, poor performance? For example, if um, a large account is closed down in the agent's territory, then that might be a reason why um, sales orders have dipped in a particular season. Or if the agent has been off, um, unable to actually go out uh, selling because of injury or illness for part of the forward selling season, that could be another reason which would be taken into account. Try to get the whole picture, do the comparison, ask the agent why it is that his performance has been poor for that season. Um, and again, consider whether it's part of a general decline in, in their figures because that will often be the way with poor performing agents is that over a course of two or three or four seasons their performance will be very bad. Different of course than if it's just a temporary blip um, of an otherwise decently performing agent. Um, the bottom line is if the agent's performance is very bad and, and if compared with others it's very bad and there's no real um, convincing explanation as to why this is then you may be able to, to terminate and avoid a, a payment afterwards. And I won't say too much about termination and payments afterwards because Rachel's going to come on and talk about that. But what's then the best practice in handling setting sales targets for, for agents? Well, inform the agent in writing of the target for the forthcoming season. Um, there's, uh, it sounds an obvious thing to say, but for many of these things get done conversations or um, at the launch for the new season, um, many of it, many, many of it, um, these sorts of conversations happen very casually and there's no record of them. Um, what I'm going to say now might prompt a few wry smiles, but if at all possible, obtain the agent's consent to his target in writing. Um, and whether you'll be able to get that consent is another matter, but it should be asked for. Um, during the forward selling season, monitor an agent's performance. Make sure you're on top of how he's doing as against target. Um, and if he's not doing particularly well as against target, uh, remind him of his overall target for the forward selling season and ask him why, why it is that he's not on track um, and what specific steps he's taking to address it uh, to make sure that he ends up you know, as close as possible to, to target at the end of the season. You might even want to, if the agent is really struggling, um, identify some potential target accounts in his area that you know you would like the agent to to target, and give a list of them to the agent and say, look, can you contact these and just feedback on um, on, on what their response is, how your meetings go with them. Um, these steps will put you in the best position to perhaps be able to terminate and avoid a payment to the agent. But unfortunately, with poor performance, there is no guarantee um, that you will be able to do that, even if you put all those steps in place. But they will put you in the best position. Moving on now to um, house accounts, which is another issue we commonly um, get asked about um, by principals. Agents of fashion brands normally have the exclusive right to sell in a specific geographical area. Um, and the regulations, the commercial regulations that Steve mentioned earlier, say that an agent with an exclusive right to a specific ge geographical area is entitled to commission on all sales to customers within that area. 
Now, exclusivity is not a matter of what's written down, it's a matter of what happens in practice. So the courts will look, if it ever went to court, at what an agent's territory is in practice, in reality. Um, so one thing may be written and another thing may actually be the, the, the real territory, depending on what's been happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So, as an example, if in practice an agent has the exclusive right to sell principal's products in London, then he'll be entitled to commission on all sales to customers based in London, even if he hasn't lifted a finger to obtain uh, that, that particular order, which counts towards those sales, or even if he doesn't know that the, the actual order's been placed. So, what about house accounts? Um, Many fashion brands will have accounts in the agent's territory that they service themselves um, and they don't pay any commission to the agent on sales to those accounts. Well, I think there's a distinction to be drawn here between um, house accounts which were agreed with an agent at the beginning of the agency um, and then what happens during the course of the agency. So if at the beginning of the agency when you're drawing up a contract or you when you're exchanging emails to actually establish the, the start of the agency agreement, you say, well, yeah, you can have exclusive right um, to London, except we will be servicing X, Y, and Z accounts. Um, that's fine. That will mean that um, the actual accounts you've identified will be, will be carved out of the agent's exclusivity. But what about if the principal wants to take back accounts during the course of the agency? Well, it depends here whether you have a written agreement or if you don't have a written agreement. If you've got a written agreement and it allows you to take back accounts during the course of the agency, then that's fine. You just follow the process which is set down in the agreement, whatever process has been agreed between you and the agent. But be careful that you don't exercise this right too many times, because although you may have the right to take accounts back, if you do it too many times, and for example, take back 50% of the agent's key accounts, the agent would have an argument to say, you've destroyed the point of our agency agreement by pretty much taking all the lucrative accounts off me. So um, on that basis, I, I can um, I say that's a, a, a breach of the agreement and I can bring it to an end and make a claim for compensation. If there's no written agreement, um, you've got to seek the agent's um, consent to taking back the house accounts, servicing it yourself and paying no commission on it. In all likelihood this will actually mean making it, cutting a deal with the agent, making a payment, um, we'll pay you X um, in return for you agreeing not to, um, that we won't pay you commission going forward on this account. If the agent doesn't agree, you can still take the um, account you want to take back and service it yourself but the agent will be still be entitled to commission on all sales to that account. So you end up with the worst of both worlds. You're doing all the work, service account, but you're still paying commission to the agent on sales to that account. So moving on to the thorny issue of competitors, which I think is one of the, the key things that we get asked um, by clients about during the course of the agency. Um, if you have a written agreement, you can deal with the issue of competitors in that agreement, and that's what we would highly recommend. But if there's no written agreement, or if the agreement's silent, what are you left with? Well, you're left with statutory duties, the commercial agent regulations, and fiduciary duties. And if I turn first to statutory duties, um, which is the duties of an agent under the commercial agent regulations, You've got Regulation 3, which contains um, the duties which an agent owes to its principal. And that says that the agent must look after the interests of his principal, and the agent's got to act dutifully. Um, what does dutifully mean? Well, case law has confirmed that essentially it means to act loyally. Also, an agent must act in good faith. Um, and good, good faith is another one of those terms which is often difficult to actually put your finger on, but the courts have described it as being fair and open dealing, containing no concealed pitfalls or traps. Um, and as um, Steve said at the beginning, um, you can't contract out of this um, regulation, so you can't agree that it won't apply. So 
Um, and the agent will owe you these duties, even if uh, there is a sort of provision in the agreement saying that, that you know, Regulation 3 will be disapplied or whatever. Um, and it's a similar, similar case for Regulation 4, which imposes similar duties on the principal as against the agent. So I mentioned before there was also fiduciary duties. Um, the fiduciary duty which is relevant here, um, fiduciary duties are part of the sort of common law duties. Um, an agent owes a duty of single-minded loyalty to his principal. So part of that duty of loyalty is the duty not to put himself in a position of conflict of interest. So what that means essentially is the agent can't act for his own benefit or the benefit of a third party without the informed consent of his principal. And what is the whole thing turns on is informed consent. The agent won't be in breach of this fiduciary duty if he has the informed <coughs> consent of both principals, both competing principals to acting for both of them at the same time. So what is informed consent? Well, effectively, it means that the agents made full disclosure of all the facts relevant to the agent, agency it proposes to take on, the competing agency, to its principal, and the principal has actually given consent to the agent going ahead and taking on that competing agency. Now, the law says it's not enough for the agent to have told half the story, and the agent must... Um, it's a high burden for the agent to actually prove that he's received consent and the agent can't say um, if he'd asked for consent it would have been given. The law says these things but actually um, as we'll see in the next slide in practice things can often be a lot more grey and a lot less black and white than that if matters like this ever go to court. So how to deal with the issue of competitors um, and some tips for principals. What do you do if you suspect one of your agents is acting for one of your competitors? Well, establish the facts first and foremost. If you only suspect that he's acting for a competitor, then you need to find out details. Uh, the commercial agent's regulations, as I said, require that an agent complies with reasonable instructions. So ask the agent to provide you with a list of their other agencies and other business interests. And we recommend that you do that at least yearly so that you can keep up to date with any changes in the agent's other business interests. One important thing that I think you should take away when it comes to um, dealing with competitors is that you need to determine a consistent um, and formal approach to how you're going to deal with competitors when you're dealing with agents. And you need to stick to it. What I mean by this is that you need to make it clear to the agents on appointment that you're not, happy, you're not prepared to consent to them acting for competitors without first coming to you and it has to be handled through a formal process. Um, so if an agent comes to you and says that I'm planning to take, take on this competing brand and you say, yeah, yeah, that's fine, don't, don't bother me with this sort of stuff again, that's absolutely fine. Um, that's a problem because that will obviously um, lead the agent into thinking that it's not a big deal, they don't necessarily have to tell you, it's all very informally done, quick chat here, quick chat there. Um, whereas if you actually implement a formal process, you know, we need to know when you're taking on another brand um, and we will inform you if it's a competing brand whether we consent or not, then you've obviously got far more control over it and the agents know where they stand when it comes to taking on other brands. Also, make sure your approach is consistent so if more than one agent is acting for a competing principal, your approach with each of them has to be the same. Um, it's going to be very difficult for you to terminate an agent's agency agreement for taking on a competing principal if three of your other agents act for that competing principal. Because although legally you're technically you're entitled to do it, the court, if it ever went to court, the court will look at that and say, well, you know, Joe Bloggs, you got a problem with him acting for them, but you haven't got a problem with these other three acting for them. What's going on here? What's the real reason for you wanting to terminate? And that can mean the difference between whether you end up paying a big payment or whether you end up paying nothing. Um, if you discover that the agent is acting for a competing principal, find out who in your management team knows about it and how long they've known about it. Um, we, we get this quite a lot where the principal will come to us and say, 
you know, Joe Boggs is, is acting for competing principle and, you know, we're not happy about it at all. But then it will turn out that the head of sales has known about it for six months or 12 months and has had a couple of conversations about it. That's why I think it's important to do these things formally um, and have uh, the, the whole sort of system top down being approached in a sort of very formal way. Um, and lastly, I suppose, take advice. I know it sounds self-serving, um, as Steve said before, but um, it's a tricky area. It's a very tricky area, competitors. Um, and you need to know that, um, that you're sort of following the correct process and you're acting as quickly as you possibly can, which is something that Rachel will talk about um, in a bit. And what about acting for non-competing brands? Um, what is the position when an agent acts for a non-competing principle? Well, most, most of the time commercial agents do carry more than one brand and most of the time they are non-competing and principals often don't have a problem with that, it's, it's how agents make their money. But the more important point is um, to consider the time spent by the agent on acting for another brand, even if it's not, not competitive. Um, if the agent is, is spending a lot of time on another business, um, and usually this will be not an agency for another business, but it will be involved in some, some sort of the highest echelons of management, far more involved, say as a director or um, sort of you know, in, a, in more management position <coughs> in another business. This can um, obviously create problems for you because the agent won't be spending enough time performing your agency, customers will be complaining, etc. The agent, if, if this is the situation and the agent may be in breach of his um, statutory duties, um, his duty to look after your interests, which is a, a duty prescribed in the commercial agent's regulations, and his duty to make proper efforts to negotiate transactions. Um, so just because it's a non-competing agency doesn't mean that it's okay if there are other problems there linked to the time that the agent's spending on, on your work. So coming full circle, um, back to where Steve um, uh, left off, I suppose, the best way to deal with all these things is in the contract, in a written contract, in express terms. Because then you can be clear what terms are agreed, you can be clear, the agent's clear what's expected of him, you're clear, everyone's clear, and you have um, the, the agency agreement which you can um, enforce if you need to. Um, I'm now going to hand, hand over to Rachel to talk about the death of the agency, um, so thank you very much.